That's what you're wearing? What? A psychedelic Ronald, a kidnapped colonel, crazed monkeys, and a creepy king. These are just some of the characters found in ads from your favorite mm. franchises to promote their brands. And there's plenty of wackiness to go around. So here are the worst fast food commercials through the decades. Step up for a bite. 1960s, Old McDonald. Isn't that McDonald's hamburger delicious? As the world's largest fast food empire, it's hard to believe McDonald's was ever the worst at anything. That might apply especially to the instantly recognizable and iconic mascot of the McMunchies, one Mr. Ronald McDonald. It might be hard to believe now, but in a world before Bart Simpson worried about being eaten by clowns, and before Stephen King's books and movies scared us off clowns for good, the usage of clowns in children's marketing was extremely commonplace in the middle of the last century. But before Mickey D settled on the now recognizable and copyrighted look of the Golden Arches mascot, Ronald looked a lot different in the early 1960s. Classified as hamburger happy, the quote unquote world's silliest and hamburger eatiness jester looked pretty odd to say the least. With a drink cup instead of a traditional red nose, a takeout tray for a hat, and a magic bottomless burger belt, the OG Ronald also made sure to push those products along the way. His slapstick antics and slap together costume eventually gave way to a more modernized image. When it came to the original Ronald, McDonald's had seen more than enough clowning around. Peekaboo! <laughs> 1960s Kidnap Colonel. What do you know about chicken? In the 1960s, KFC was a brand on the rise, with Colonel Harlan Sanders' famous secret deep fried chicken recipe becoming a hit all across the United States. His restaurant chain had over 600 locations after just 10 years in business. The Colonel sold his chain to a group of investors in 1964, and business continued to boom. KFC added another 1,200 locations nationwide in the next next four years, bringing their total to 1,700 by 1968. The unmistakable image of the Kentucky Colonel naturally lent itself to being front and center in ad campaigns for the rapidly booming brand. The legendary secret recipe of 11 herbs and spices has indeed remained under lock and key to this day. I wouldn't have known this of the secret recipe. But in this questionable commercial, it didn't stop some desperate housewives from trying to get the colonel to spill the tea. Strapping poor Mr. Sanders to a chair and a lie detector in a dark room complete with a swinging light bulb, angry close-ups, and an evil laugh, the colonel doesn't dish on any of the actual ingredients. Rather a sucker for punishment, he spends the ad laughing it off as he jokes about the 11 herbs and spices supposedly including things like his grandfather's overcoat, three shoelaces, and a hubcap. The whole thing comes off rather sinister and aggressive just to sell buckets of chicken that are frankly finger-licking good enough to sell themselves. You eat the skin off of every piece of chicken! Well, I saved you all the chicken part. 1970s, Goldilocks and the Three Pizzas. Something's cooking. <laughs> Restaurants cranking out bad commercials aren't just exclusive to burgers and fries. We all remember Goldilocks and the Three Bears, but you'll have to bear with us for this next awful ad. The original fairy tale story of Goldilocks dates back to the 19th century, but it wasn't until the 1950s that Shakey's Pizza burst onto the scene before debuting this commercial two decades later. Shakey's namesake and founder was Sherwood Shakey Johnson, who opened the first location in Sacramento. California in 1954, making the claim of America's first franchised pizza chain under the trademarked slogan of World's Greatest Pizza. The chain expanded across the USA and even as far as the Philippines, Japan, and Singapore before crossing paths with the Den of Three Bears for an ad campaign in the 1970s. This pizza is Amazing! The idea of Goldilocks ditching porridge for pizza makes perfect sense, because there's not one of us who wouldn't make that decision. However, the inclusion of three singing bears is where this one crosses over into being unbearable. With the tagline of, we serve fun at Shakey's, also pizza. They seemingly had the right idea, but the wrong execution before the combination of talking animals and tasty pizza became a craze featured at Showbiz Pizza Place and Chuck Lucky cheese in the following decades. Sometimes you have to do whatever it takes for a good pizza, including grin and bear it. Pizza. 1970s Animation Domination. 
I love cartoons. We now switch gears from Goldilocks and the Three Bears to Wendy and the Three Burgers. When Wendy's was founded in 1969 in Columbus, Ohio, Dave Thomas's concept of square burgers on round buns was unique enough to catch on in the rapidly expanding American fast food market. With the slogan, quality is our recipe, he named his new restaurant chain Wendy's, which was his daughter Melinda's nickname. As the face of the franchise, Wendy got some 1970s TV time in cartoons cartoon form as an animated ad. Ooh, cartoons. The commercials themselves are fine and reasonably well animated for their day, but are pretty thin on anything else. In a world that by then had become borderline overcrowded with restaurants cashing in on fast hamburgers and McDonald's and Burger King eating up the competition through national expansion, the commercial didn't set itself apart from anything else. There's no sign of a frosty or a classic chili, and the trademark square patties aren't even mentioned. Sure, you get burgers and a mascot, but that was the bare minimum for success in the 70s. And these three cartoony cuts of meat didn't do anything beyond that to draw in business. 1970s, McDonald's Gone Mad. Grab a hold of Ronald's hand. The 1960s were well known for counterculture and hippies, but according to this next commercial, some of those psychedelic effects lasted into the next decade. By this point in 1970, Ronald McDonald had evolved into his more recognizable and polished form, but the introduction of the Happy Meal was still almost 10 years away, and the company needed a way to keep kids begging their folks for a McDonald's run. Hence, this commercial from McD's seems like it was filmed after some experimenting with LSD. A hallucinating swirl of live-action, googly-eyed scenery includes apple pie trees, a hamburger patch, milkshake volcanoes, and a french fry satch, while Ronald and his companion skip across the landscape as if they're off to see the wizard. Except this yellow brick road ends at a pair of yellow arches. The surrealist scene is lifelike enough to be weird, but not cartoony enough to be fun, and bumping into this cast of characters would scare any kid away from their local McDonald's place. Play place. Whatever illicit substances were responsible for this commercial must have been potent, and the Woodstock-inspired backing track only adds to the way-out wackiness that keeps this commercial as one of the worst. That was terrible. 1980s, a beef about beef. We got beef. After trying 2D animation for a one-dimensional commercial, Wendy's struck gold in the following decade. But the commercials turned out to be so good that in the end, they were bad for the company. It was 1983 when we saw the debut of an outspoken senior citizen and her constant search for a bigger burger patty. The Where's the Beef commercials were an instant hit, pushing Wendy's square patties as having more surface and size than its competitors. This over-the-top cat phrase became so popular that it was even uttered by presidential hopeful Walter Mondale during the 1984 presidential election and spawned a hit Top 40 single. When I hear your new ideas, I'm reminded of that ad. Where's the beef? The ad campaign was a runaway success, but winds up on this list because the star of the show ran away. Even though she was responsible for Wendy's sales numbers increasing 30%, actress Clara Peller wasn't legally attached to the brand and eventually jumped ship to do ads for Prego Pasta Sauce in 1985. Wendy's quickly canceled the Where's the Beef campaign and fired Clara, but without the popular commercials, the company dropped into a two-year-long sales slump and, according to the New York Times, had their brand awareness plummet for the following five years. Because this blessing turned into a curse, it's got to be considered one of the worst. Where's the beef? Before we get to more commercials, if it's your first time here, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much. 1980s, Little Nibble, Big Trouble. Nibble here. Lick here. We've heard of picky eaters, but this commercial really pushes it. In the wake of Wendy's disastrous fallout from Where's the Beef, the company went from questioning where the beef was to questioning what its next steps would be. Hiring a new ad agency in 1987, Wendy's pivoted to a new campaign called Give a Little Nibble that featured customers literally picking at their food before they ate it. Grabbing bits from a giant burger was supposed to emphasize tasting the quality of the beef before tasting the burger as a whole. Give a little nibble. 
but it only ended up emphasizing Wendy's woes. The company had lost $4.6 million in 1986 after losing Clara Peller, and in the first three months of 1987, they lost $6.8 million trying to replace her with these lackluster ads. Through this new ad agency, Wendy's had financed and filmed enough content for the Little Nibble commercials to run for nine months, but they proved so ineffective that they were pulled from TV after only seven weeks, making this a commercial fail. Your commercials? They suck. <laughs> 1980s Hamburger Herb. This man is Herb. While watching Wendy's riding high on the success of Where's the Beef, Burger King decided to get in on the action with a crazy character of its own. Except this one didn't do very well. Commonly referred to as Herb the Nerd, the mysterious Herb was purported to be the only person in the country that had never eaten at Burger King. No Whoppers, no Bacon King, no Croissant and no Chicken Tenders. But who was this Herb? The commercial campaign led up to a big reveal with a Super Bowl ad in 1986 and was followed with a cash giveaway contest to anyone who spotted Herb eating at their local BK. <laughs> the commercials were fun and enticing, but at no point did it recommend anyone to go eat at Burger King or push a new product of any kind. And the excitement was gone once Herb's bespectacled burger-munching face was finally revealed during the Super Bowl. The advertising campaign and subsequent giveaways wound up costing the king a big chunk of his kingdom with a $40 million investment, but wound up causing Burger King's profits to plummet by 40% when the whole idea flopped. That is the worst idea I've ever heard! 1980s, Mickey D's to the moon. To the moon, Lois! We already saw the Golden Arches get weird in the 1970s, but in the decade that followed, they decided to try it again. This 1980s ad campaign was a spoof on lounge singers from the 50s and 60s, and commercials featured a crescent-shaped crooner. Going by the name Mac Tonight, this unnervingly bizarre burger aficionado was a piano-playing, moon-headed mascot that wore sunglasses at night and became an oddly striking image next to the usual cast of cuter McDonald's mascots like Ronald, Grimace, Birdie, and the Hamburglar. Easy, new guy. The home of Ronald McDonald has seen almost 50 separate USA-specific marketing campaigns over its nearly seven decades of being around, and Ronald McDonald has had his share of mascots that have moved in with him over all those years. But this one is certainly the strangest. Mac Tonight's crooning career only spanned three years from 1986 to 1989 before the microphone was officially unplugged when McDonald's was sued by the estate of popular singer Bobby Darin, whom Mac Tonight most closely parodied. The late-night lounge singer was forced to hang up his sunglasses, and the Mac Tonight commercials burned out faster than a shooting star. Come down to Mac Tonight. 1990s, headed for disaster. <laughs> As the clock turned to the 1990s, one chain used its actual food as a mascot. Pizza Hut's series of commercials, dubbed the Pizza Head Show, ran for almost the entire decade before getting pulled in 1997. An adorable slice of pizza with a face made out of toppings, Pizza Head was designed to appeal to kids and young adults, and spent many of his ads promoting crossovers with big properties of the time, like Marvel comic books, Marvel trading cards, Goosebumps books, Star Wars, Wars and Johnny Quest, as well as promoting Pizza Hut's weekly kids' night or food specials like stuffed crust pizza or triple decker pizza. Pizza guy, I'm a pizza guy. Despite their longevity, the ads weren't well received and were frankly a little depressing. Pizza Head's adventures involved him trying to outrun his nemesis, a pizza cutter named Steve who was out to slice and dice our hero. But the innocent little guy always failed in spectacular fashion. Pizza Head was stepped on by shoes, roller pinned, stretched, squished, burned, bounced, blasted, and even blown up by a meteor. And on top of that, he never defeated or even managed to escape the evil pizza cutting Steve. Sometimes we just want the good guy to win, but at least there was pizza to brighten our mood. It's time for you to go home. 1990s Pizza Hut 5 Bucks 
it's five dollars. The Pizza Head show wasn't the Hut's only questionable choice when it came to marketing in the 90s. Nowadays, actor Craig Robinson often reminds us that no one out pizzas the Hut. But a catchy slogan preceded the current campaign when it took over the 90s. We're all familiar with the five bucks, five bucks, five bucks promotion, but it originally debuted saving a few more dollars with the cheaper price tag of four bucks, four bucks in 1990. Really good deal. Wholesale deal. Now, we get it. Repetitiveness can be the key to memorable advertising, but this was a little much. And if the original didn't burn itself into your brain hard enough, the sequel somehow managed to be even more annoying. Four years after the original, a commercial using the repetitive voice of a parrot made sure no one within earshot could ignore the five bucks, five bucks promo. Five bucks? What about a meat lover? Five bucks! The high-pitched and squeaky tone was bad enough, but hearing it six times over the course of a 30-second span would wear down anyone's eardrums. Oh, and a human voice says five bucks twice more on top of that, just in case you hadn't had enough yet. Super annoying. 1990s, just kidding around. Are you kidding me? Why can't we all just get along? This McD's commercial decided to pick a side, but ended up making everyone else mad in the process. Faced with an aging customer base that was becoming disinterested in the restaurant's little kid image, featuring its cast of cartoon characters alongside Happy Meals and Play Places, Mickey D's decided to talk straight to the adults in the room. Their adulting push for a mature image led the company to spend an astronomical $300 million on production, research, and marketing before they arrived at a sufficiently sophisticated sandwich they called the Arch Deluxe. Targeted at adults, advertisements featured a classroom of kids excited about everything on the McDonald's menu, except for the supposedly chef-crafted Arch Deluxe. It might be a masterpiece. Debuting in May of 1996 with the tagline, The Burger with the Grown-Up Taste, it included fancified ingredients like circle-cut black pepper bacon and Dijon mayo on a potato bun. However, commercials portraying it as all grown up actually alienated most of the customer base, since people are well aware they aren't going to McDonald's for fancy food. It turns out there's no age limit for enjoying McNuggets and fries, and the burger was pulled from the menu after four years of poor sales. This is the worst! 1990s, barking up the wrong tree. Bless you, Taco Bell. They say a dog is man's best friend, but the jury's out on whether that's also true for the relationship between dogs and taco restaurants. From the fall of 1997 to the summer of 2000, the world was treated to a series of Taco Bell commercials featuring a chihuahua that, rather than barking, spoke with a cartoon voice. The cute and charismatic little character was featured in a variety of situations, including police standoffs, late-night landline phone calls, high-speed car chases, and even hitting the drive through with Godzilla. The Taco Bell dog and his Yo quiero Taco Bell. catchphrase became a cultural hit, but the outlandish ads weren't popular with everyone. Eventually being deemed culturally insensitive and stereotypical to Latin American cultures, the commercials created a large controversy amongst the Mexican-American population. To make things worse, they weren't making any money. Taco Bell's sales numbers had dipped by 6% in early 2000, convincing corporate that no matter how popular the commercials were, they weren't inspiring folks to buy tacos. The fun but failed commercials ultimately burned out as a fad in less than three years on TV screens. Obvious meal for Taco Bell dog. 2000's Monkey Business. What kind of business? Monkey business. Ever since opening its first shop in 1981, Quiznos has brought that toasty and tasty goodness to the world. That's a full 24 years before Subway introduced their version of toasted sandwiches in 2005. But in all that time, Quiznos was unable to replicate the Subway success story. To try and grab a new market in the new millennium, Quiznos went outside the box and a little bit off the rails with a new commercial. 
Viral ads featuring mascot rodent puppets named the Sponge Monkeys bombarded TV and computer screens throughout 2004. But viewers were taken aback by the Sponge Monkeys' off-putting appearance and off-key singing. This is $1,200 a week for voice lessons, and this is what I get? At the least, they grabbed your attention, even if they didn't convince you to grab some Quiznos takeout. And despite developing a cult following over the years, the lack of sales created by the Sponge Monkeys' weird looks and wailing sounds became a big problem. Quiznos had about 4,000 nationwide locations in 2005, but has since dealt with bankruptcy in 2014 and 95% of its stores being closed by 2023. Only some 150 Quiznos were left standing at that point. And while we're not directly blaming the Sponge Monkeys commercials, it's a tough coincidence for a tough-to-swallow commercial. They are tasty, they are crunchy, they are warm because they toasted! 2000's Not So Good Morning Good morning! As a mascot, the Burger King character has been around since the company's creation in 1955, when a cartoony king was pictured on the original restaurant signage. The character went through a few interactions, including as an animated character for 1970s commercials. By 1976, he became a physical mascot known as the Marvelous Magical Burger King, who was capable of magic tricks that kept his customers and citizens from ever going hungry. That magical and marvelous commercial concept was eventually retired in the 1980s, but the eventually outdated 1970s king made his not-so-triumphant return in 2000 to promote the company's revamped breakfast menu and the BK Joe coffee line. When you picture regal royalty, you might think of capes and crowns carrying warmth and wisdom from the olden days. In this case, though, it was anything but. Who dares defy the king? The tagline, Wake Up With The King, was quite literal, with unsuspecting customers waking up to a silent, smiling, staring king offering them breakfast foods, like the then-new breakfast croissant sometimes in their own bed, sometimes staring through the window of the bedroom, and even once at a morning construction site, His Royal Highness's home invasions were anything but a positive experience for viewers. The Morning Monarch was unceremoniously retired for the second time in 2011, with Burger King's CFO declaring, quote, We got rid of the creepy king character that tended to scare away women and children. We're pretty sure breakfast is supposed to be the most important meal of the day, not the scariest. Arrest these fleeing peasants and throw them in the tower! 2000's Car Wash Controversy You've heard that sex sells, but that doesn't sound like that's the case when it comes to hamburgers. Beautiful babes and magnificent models have been used to sell products for as long as products have existed. But in 2005, a Carl's Jr. attempt to sell a spicy and sexy cheeseburger just wasn't hot enough. Celebrity socialite Paris Hilton was a highly touted commodity in 2005, thanks in large part to the success of the reality show The Simple Life, and her good looks seemed like a good idea to Carl's Jr.'s advertising department. A commercial featuring Paris chomping down on a Carl's Jr. spicy barbecue $6 burger during a bikini car wash debuted in May 2005 and generated immediate interest, just not in the actual product. Just washing your car. A couple split-second shots of the burger is all you get, while viewers are distracted by everything else that's going on. The advertisement reportedly cost between four and five million dollars to produce and air in Carl's Jr. markets, and about the same amount to run for its sister franchise, Hardee's. But for all the Hilton hamburger hype, the company only had a measly 1.7 percent sales increase to show for it after running the ads for a month. Beauty and the Beast became Beauty and the Beef, but it's no mystery why this burger ad that showed almost no burgers in it wasn't any good at selling them. We failed! 2010's It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia 
I'd like to order my food in a German accent. Not everybody gets along with their family, but that doesn't mean we need to have a family feud about it. In this commercial case, Jack from Jack in the Box has an awkward family gathering that turns a little sour after the introduction of Jack in the Box's signature sourdough. To push the Philly cheesesteak sourdough melt, Jack visits his cousin Joey in Philadelphia, whose family is chock full of East Coast cliches, including mullet haircuts, thick accents, and an obsession with ice hockey, including wearing sports jerseys at the dinner table. I'm busting your chops. The cheesesteak's good. Now, being that Jack in the Box has been a predominantly West Coast chain since its inception in 1951, maybe they thought nobody from Pennsylvania would ever see the commercials and that they'd fly under the radar. But instead of pointing fingers and including stereotypes, it seems the classier thing to do would be to utilize some positive Philadelphia lore, like Rocky Balboa or the Liberty Bell, to sell cheesesteak. Instead, we get introduced to a Jack in the Box extended universe that leaves us with more questions than answers, including if there are other regional box families and just how many of them might also use ridiculous regional stereotypes to sell burgers. Maybe this agitating ad is one that Jack should have kept in the box. No idea's a bad idea! 2010's The Crown and the Clown You're gonna die, clown! You might have heard the song Tears of a Clown, but this next ad is all about fears of clowns. Technically referred to as coolerophobia, the fear of clowns is estimated to afflict more than 40% of Americans. But the marketing department at Burger King was rather fearless when they leaned into the image of scary clowns for a Halloween campaign in 2017. Using the tagline, come as a clown, eat like a king, for what the company dubbed Scary Clown Night, the promotion featured a Whopper giveaway for customers who showed up dressed in clown costumes on Halloween night, and featured a motivating macabre digital commercial of not-so-funny clowns chasing down a victim on a dark and shadowy night before arriving at a Burger King location. People hate clowns now. The ad also featured a jab at the competition's McMascot when a not-so-subtle red-and-yellow Ronald McDonald-styled clown makes an appearance. It's a great idea, but runs into an unfortunate snag. The commercial is actually intense and wouldn't be out of place in any big-screen horror film. And it would be downright frightening to anybody who specifically suffers from a fear of clowns. We love a Whopper as much as anyone, but a nightmare scenario of being run down by a gang of crazy clowns on a dark Halloween night just to get a free one is asking a lot. Count me out later! Stay tuned, cause we got more. Just tap or click on another video. Thanks for watching.